I encourage you this morning, if you haven't already done so, to pick up your third card in Dying to Self. We're talking about part of the way to do that is to constantly keep before us in our mind, thinking about our life and thinking about the life that, that God is calling us to. How many of you remember your first bicycle? Raise your hand if you remember your first bicycle. Do you remember the first time that you got that? Maybe it was for Christmas, maybe it was for his birthday, but that was a special gift. It was a big gift, and you knew that you were ready to graduate from the tricycle or the big wheel, and now you're ready. And this was not just going to be like any other present. This was a mode of transportation. It was a rite of passage. And it, it's kind of an, an, an iconic scene in America, you know, that you getting your, your first bike and a child hopping up on, on top of Schwinn, and, and they trust their father or their mother, as the case may be, that's helping them to learn to ride it, but they also trust their training wheels. Let's welcome some training riders in progress. Come on in. First, we have Sydney Shepard coming with her father. Next, we have Wyatt Cooper, and then Marissa Bender, and then Caleb Officer, and also Hannah Segrist. Let's give them a big hand. Great job, guys. <laughs> Learn how to ride. This is awesome. Fantastic. I think we got one more coming. <laughs> John. <laughs> John, what are you doing, buddy? <laughs> What's it look like I'm doing? I'm riding a bike. I heard it was bike day today, so I thought, hey, I'm bringing mine too. Okay, well, what's up with the bike? Uh, it, it's, it's kicking. It's got blue and black frame. I mean, 18 gears on this bad boy. I even have front and back brakes. Okay, let me, let me rephrase that. What's up with the training wheels? I didn't even know they made them for bikes that big. Oh, if they don't, Brad, duh. No, I had these specially made. I like them. So you, you fabricated them yourself? Totally, yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I guess that's fine. You're just getting started out, but um, didn't you ever learn how to ride a bike? Um, Brad, I, I just rode down the main aisle. Did you not no. see that? <laughs> John, John, that, that's not riding your bike. I, I promise, after services, I, I can teach you how if you want to. I, I, I can. Well, no, I, I think I'm good, dude. I think I, I've got this. I mean, this is, this is awesome. Okay, you'll, you'll go faster. I promise. I could totally find you a pair for your bike. No, no, you, you, you'll go faster, you're going to have a lot more fun, uh, I, I promise. No, I, no, I got to go, and you know, you know what they say, slow and steady is, is the way to go. Okay, John, that, that's not right. Let, let's give John a hand. Good, good job. Uh, wow. Better safe than sorry. Maybe his boys can teach him a little bit. Well, you know, that, that phase of, of riding with training wheels is it, fine, and it's a lot of fun. But there becomes that, that Saturday morning. Usually it's on Saturday when, when Dad has a little bit of time. And it's Sunday outside, and he breaks out the wrenches. Dad, do you, do you remember that day? And so you start getting the wrenches out, and, and it's really terrifying for a child. But they start thinking about this, and they're, they're confident. They're confident that their training wheels have trained them to ride a bike, right? Because that's what they're, they're in training, and they've been through this, this period of training. Now they're ready to go. And so dad runs beside the bicycle. Remember this? You're holding on to the seat, and you get them up to speed, and things are going good, and they're no longer wobbling. And so you let go. And boy, they go cruising along and run right into a curb, and off they go, face first. And so they turn around. <laughs> and do you remember this? And then the, the child, you know, is kind of crying and everything. And they're, they're not really looking at themselves. They're looking at you. And they're looking at you and they're saying, I told you not to let go. Do you remember this? And they're like, well, yeah, but you're never going to learn unless you. And then mom is there on, on the porch, right? And, and she's got the, the ointment and she's got a Band-Aid. And she's got a look for you that says, Dad, I told you they weren't ready. You know, I kind of scold you. And so what do you do? You go put, you get your wrenches out and put, the, put them back on. We'll, we'll try another day. And so 
man, it's, it, it's tough. It's tough learning how to ride a bike. Well, in, in all reality, there's a little study this week. Training wheels haven't been around all that long. In fact, in the early 1900s is when they started putting them together. And they were an obvious solution to an obvious problem. Because people looking at a bike know that they're not going to stand up on their own. So how do we give confidence to the rider? Well, I know. We'll strap on more wheels. It will add more stability. But anyone that's been on a tricycle or a bicycle with training wheels knows it doesn't provide more stability in the long run. In, in reality, it makes things more precarious, and it makes matters worse. Well, to learn to ride a bike, you have to solve two problems. Number one is you have to figure out the whole pedaling thing, right? But the second thing that's a lot more difficult is learning how to balance, right? And so the pedaling bit is, is what we'll start off on first. And so that comes pretty easy, but it's, it's, that's the easy part of the equation. But learning to balance is much more difficult a task. But the training tool that eliminates the need to balance the training wheels, if, if, if it's teaching us to do that, it actually slows down the process of learning how to ride a bike. So training wheels only teach you how to ride a bike with what? Training wheels. But it doesn't teach you really what it means to ride a bike. Well, some children get very good at this space and, and could tool around and actually could pick up some pretty good speed. And, man, they're, they're tearing up the sidewalks, and they get very comfortable, especially if there's other kids around that have training wheels, and they're going. They're like, I like this. And then you've got to convince them there's something more. There's some, no, I'm, I'm good. And, and usually it's when one kid in, in the neighborhood, a child gets their training wheels off, and they start seeing how much faster they're going and some of the stuff they're able to do that they're limited by their training wheels that they finally say, it's okay. Well, MIT engineer uh, David, uh, Dr. David Wilson dismisses this long-held practice of using training wheels. He says this, it is hard to see how training wheels can inculcate any of the desired balancing habits unless the training wheels are actually off the ground. I don't know if you tried this. We tried this with, with our daughter, Maggie. She was kind of one of the last holdouts, not wanting to get rid of her training wheels. So I, I, they got little sliders on them. So I thought, oh, when she's not looking, I'm going to slide them up an inch so she starts getting Well, what she ended up doing was tilting her bike over like this and trying to ride. It was very awkward watching her do this thing. But she wanted the security of having that training wheels there. And so it's very painful to watch. Well, many feel the solution is something new that's just come out. I don't know if, if y'all are up on this, kind of trendy, but I'm up on trendy things. So this is, an, have y'all seen this? This is the new uh, glider or slider bike. And what they, what they actually teach you to do is teach your child how to balance before you do all the pedaling. Now, you can, if you don't want to pay the $69 on Amazon like I did, you can just lower the seat a little bit and take the, the pedals off. And what they encourage you to do is get your child on a nice day, to put them on a gentle slope, not a big one, but a gentle grassy slope, and get them to practice pushing with their feet and kind of getting the feel of balancing. So once they start learning the whole balancing part, well, then the pedaling comes later. Now, it's still a tricky thing to learn how to pedal and balance, but if it's a lot easier to learn how to balance first, then pedal, than it is learn how to balance while you're pedaling. You understand what I'm saying? Because that's what's going on. Well, we're in our fourth week of our Dying to Self series, which we've been examining this whole idea to live as Christ, is what Paul said. We also realize to die is gain. And what Paul meant there is, I don't care if I'm here or if I've got to take him up to heaven, God's going to be glorified either way. What we've said is, us to live in this world, we've got to learn to die to ourselves. So you're probably thinking, well, what does it have to do with bikes and training wheels? So I'm, I'm going to get there. Because I think sometimes we have the desire to live as disciples of Christ, but sometimes our approaches to make that happen inhibit the discipleship process altogether. Well, what God is after in us is learning how to trust in him completely. God wants us to give us 
uh, for us to give our hearts to God and to be completely looking at all that we do in life and say, God, it's no longer me that's living, but Christ that's living inside of me. So many times, good activities that, that we start doing sometimes help us to limp down the road a little bit without truly experiencing the life that we see in Scripture that God is calling his disciples to live out. Well, just as uh, riding a bike has two parts, so does discipleship. And the first part of this is believing in God. Okay? you got to believe. And the second part of that is learning to trust in God. That's why he said in a lot of passages, Peter talks about how that, we, that Jesus is both our Lord and our Master. Okay? He, he, he's our Savior, but he's also our Lord. So we have this whole lordship where, where God is helping us to define ourselves in a new way. He doesn't just save us. We, we believe in that salvation that we talked about in the empty tomb we talked about last week. But now we're moving into discipleship. How do we make him our Lord? How do we make him everything in our life? So here are some things that I've kind of laid out that have the potential to limit our discipleship. These aren't going to be really, really fan favorites here. But train wheel number one, sometimes we substitute our time of worship for authentic community. So it's tempting to reduce being part of the church family here to coming in from time to time for our worship services. We're, we're glad you're here. Don't, don't get me wrong. We're, we're happy you've chosen to be here at Twickenham this morning. But especially if you kind of slip in after the dreaded meet and greet during the welcome, and then you slip out during the announcements, you have the ability to be a part of things without ever interacting with those around us, without a single person in the assembly. Well, you, you may laugh, you may cry, you may be confused about kids on bike like the, like the people around you, but it's no different than experiencing something as a part of an audience down at the Cineplex. You're not connected to those people, nor are you connected to the body of Christ as Scripture lays out. You know, Scripture describes a different kind of reality for disciples. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 44, it says, All the believers were together and had everything in common. Well, they started selling their possessions and goods, and they gave to one another as they had need. Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to the number daily those that were being saved. Am I calling us to live in a commune? No. And, and, and what was happening in Jerusalem what was special. But what I am calling us to see from this passage is there was an interconnectedness. There was this whole community that God is calling us to be a part of. Last week during spring break, Jill and I and the family were out of town. I got a text from, from Kelvin Malone. Is Kelvin here this morning? There he is up there. Kelvin and Nancy, good, good to see you guys. And I hope you guys don't mind me sharing this. Probably should have checked ahead of time. But Kel, Kelman sends me a text. And he says, I'm not sure what's going on with Nancy. And uh, she's gone down to uh, Huntsville Hospital. They're, they're running some text, some tests. Well, my first thing to do was to call Barry and Vicki Johnson and say, listen, we've got a member from our life group that's in the hospital. Get the word out. Get our group praying for them. The second text was to Steve, who was, who was back man in the office, so that the whole congregation would know what's going on. Because the way we've set things up is small groups are our first line of defense. That's our, our smaller community that we get to experience. But within our small group, we laugh together, we, we cry together, we pray for one another, we challenge each other. Sometimes we even call each other on the carpet. But within our small group, we've had marriage proposals. We've had, we've had folks that have asked for prayers for infertility. We've had people that have announced that they have cancer, and we're going to walk through all that together. That's community that we see described in Scripture. And that's what I'm calling us to do is to live life together. We're not designed to walk with the Lord solo, but rather to walk hand in hand with one another. Well, the second training wheel that I want us to call attention to is when we substitute Bible class for biblical transformation. I know I'm thin ice here but I've, I've known people that have gone to class for years and, and some have grown by leaps and bounds 
and just seeing what they've, they've done as, as new Christians to start growing once they understand they're exposed to Scripture. But I've also seen others that haven't grown appreciably in decades. Why is that? Well, sometimes we, we walk in and we grab coffee and start talking about golf and, and, and fancy football and what's going on with the kids and different things. And folks are kind of strolling in 15, 20, 30 minutes late, you know. And, and so it's kind of hard to get started. And, and maybe we have 20 to 25 minutes of, of concentrated time. And so we, we'll learn a few things because we, we've got a teacher that's invested a lot of time in, in study and in prayer and, and in crafting this lesson. And so, you know, you're, you're listening, you're kind of hearing, oh, well, that, that's very interesting, that, that's very useful. And then you may even throw in a comment or two. But what happens is, for some, that's it. If you're exposed to the information, then it's gone. And then the next week, the teacher gets up and says, well, let's review. What did we talk about last week? And it's kind of crickets. Maybe someone will, will throw in something that kind of jogs your mind. But other people are sitting there going, I can't even remember what book we were in last week. It's just been seven days. Why is that? Well, it's pretty interesting. A psychologist, Herman Ebbinghaus, crafted what he called the curve of forgetting. When we attempt uh, and uh, attend a lecture and we're exposed to information, what, what happens on, on day one is, if, if this is all new information for us, we go from zero to 100% of the content that's given us. But... 24 hours later, on day two, we're down about 50 to 80% of that we've forgotten. A week later, it's down to about 10%. And by day 30, it's down to 3 to 4%, maybe, of what was presented. Even though we thought it was great content, we're like, okay, I can't remember exactly what we talked about. And I know it was good, but I, I don't know. Well, well, what happens is, with our brain is, our, our brain has what's called short-term memory and long-term memory. And so we, in our short-term memory, we get a lot of things that are dumped in there. And so someone tells us an address of a restaurant to meet them for lunch. Or, or someone else introduces us, one of your friends introduces you to a friend that, that lives out of state. You know you're never going to see them again. And so you remember their name just during lunch, but then you kind of dump that information. Well, along with all the stuff that, that we read on the Internet, on our homepage and different things, all that stuff, we're constantly being bombarded. Well, the brain can't hold it all, so what it does is after a certain period of time, it begins dumping things. And so along with the stuff that we don't need gets lopped in some of the stuff that we're actually interested in that we learned in this lecture. And so how do we prevent that? Well, Ebbinghaus not only identified the problem, but actually came up with a solution. And teenagers, you guys need to listen to this because it will help you with your schoolwork. It's really a cool idea. If within 24 hours on day two, you'll spend 10 minutes with the material that your, that your teacher has given you, just 10 minutes, you will raise up what was spoken up to almost 100%. And if you go in at day seven and you just look over the same material after you've done it on day two, day seven for five minutes, you'll bring it back up to almost 100%. And a month out, if you'll spend two to three minutes, you'll remember it all. Why is that? Well, the brain is just remarkable. And what ends up happening is, if we're hit with the same information over and over again, it starts going into a different channel, and the brain starts saying, I'm supposed to remember these things. Uh, perhaps I need to store this, because I'm getting hit with this over and over again. Oh, there it is. I better keep that. Well, consider kind of how we do things compared with what we see modeled in Scripture. In Acts 17, verse 11, it says, Now the Bereans were a more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness. Okay, they, they received it, they liked it, and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul was saying was true it do it produces character within them that's why it's so important when we're having breakfast we'll, uh, Jill and I and the kids will we'll go through these and it, it's amazing you know we're we're almost uh, a month out on, on week one and our, our kids can recite some of these things it's just wonderful and what it, it does is it starts training it starts getting put into the brain and starts saying this is important this is transformational Psalms 19 verse 11 through 16 says 
I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Listen to the psalmist's passion for God's word. Teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that came from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes. As one rejoices in great riches, you can almost seem like lifting up gold coins. I meditate on your precepts. Consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Because the word is important. The word word gets hidden within our heart. To where no matter what's going on, it's a reservoir reservoir that we can pull through do you remember when we had our guest speaker beverly ross that talked about when she was going through the valley of the shadow of death where she lost her daughter she said she couldn't even think clearly as to what she was saying but she was being bombarded left and right with scriptures she didn't realize that were part of her reservoir that she didn't even have to pick up scripture it was just coming it was coming And it was God's words that that are coming out of a deep place within. We've got to guard our hearts and hide these treasures within them. Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 through 7 says, These commandments I give you today are upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, when you get caught up. And I encourage us not just to go to Bible class. I do encourage you to go to Bible class. But be an active participant. You know, if if you're not teaching, take notes. Study along with the teacher and what he's talking about outside of class. You have have something to to contribute to the discussion. And believe me, there are plenty plenty of resources available online. Engage in the material. Pray for your teacher. Here's another thing. Take your turn at teaching. As we talked about, those that are crafting lessons grow tremendously in what they do. I'm, I'm completely on board with what Jesse and Shelby are doing with our teens because they're asking our teens, we want you to go and present the lesson from time to time. And so we have, uh, over the past few weeks, Colton Smith, Ellen Horton, Jonathan Perry, Claire McKee, and Joshua Owens, and Abby McKee have all taken their turn teaching the whole group. And, and last Wednesday night was Dylan Pollard. And if you want to treat, come here, Claire Chastain, this week. We'll all just show up in a blur away. But we also have our middle schoolers that, that are teaching the devotionals to their peers. And, and kind of the old way of thinking about this, well, isn't that what we pay for that couple to be? Di-? No, what we're calling them to do is train our youth to be disciples of Christ, not just to teach Bible lessons. And teaching helps to craft that and to shape them into the image of Christ. The final training wheel that I picked out is sometimes in our minds we substitute giving money for participation in ministry and mission. You know, certainly even in the last century, I mean, in the first century, there were paid ministry positions. And Paul teaches that those that work have, some, have the right to make their living, even uh, those in full-time ministry. 1 Timothy 5 and verse 18 says, The workers deserve his wages. And certainly there were those we learned in Scripture that financed Jesus and, and the disciples and those who went out on missionary journeys. But paying local ministry specialists was never, in, in Scripture, equated with the entire ministry of the church. There's so much more to that. And supporting missionaries as they go out on mission was never the entire mission of the church. We're all called to be missionaries. We're all called to be evangelists. You know, in Luke's telling of the gospel, it's pretty incredible. We have the disciples coming together for the first time in Luke chapter 6. And so he gets them all together. And, and we see in the next couple of chapters that as Jesus takes them out, well, he's casting out demons and he's healing the sick and he's talking about the kingdom of God. And then in Luke chapter 9, in verse 1 through 6, says, when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. They weren't ready. They'd only been with Jesus for a few months, and he's sending them out. He says, I'm giving you the power and authority to go out and do this. I'm sure some of them are like going, not without you with us. You've been here right beside us. You want us to go out? We're not ready. We need more training. 
We need more time to apprentice underneath you. We, we need more experience before we can go out and, and do what you've been doing. What Jesus is thinking is, I'm here for a short time. I'm about ready to turn the reins over to you. And you're not going to be ready when the Spirit comes upon you. When I turn things over and I've gone back up to heaven, unless you go now. Part of the discipleship process is going part of the the ability to share your faith is making mistakes and and talking with someone and they ask you a question go i don't know but i'll get back with you i'm growing just like you are that's part of the discipleship mission but you know it's it's tough you know we have the priesthood was substituted by the priesthood of all believers no longer is it it is it a title that's given he said those titles are gone go we're all priests. We're all ministers within our fellowship. Go. You've been commissioned. You've been given what God has given, the Holy Spirit living within you. Go. Be active in your faith. But this new way of thinking sometimes is hard. It's difficult for us to kind of retrain our brains in that way. Mark Twain wrote about learning to ride a bicycle. He said this, The intellect has to teach the limbs to discard their old education and to adopt the new. You know, maybe it's time for us to rethink our marks of discipleship, to recall, to return to call of, of authentic ministry that we see that he put upon those he came in contact with, of putting our faith into action, dying to ourself, doing all we can to completely trust in him. Please. Don't walk out of here thinking that I've said something that I haven't this morning. Our time in worship, attending Bible class, and certainly stewardship, all those are valuable things. I just want to make sure that we are looking at what's going on. What I'm saying is if we're not careful, we can participate in these things on a regular basis and still not die to self. We can walk out of these doors and live life any way that we'd like to, and still be in good standing. We've got to reframe and understand what Jesus said was the marks of discipleship. In any lesson, you really have three options when things are put before you. One is to continue business as usual. And just say, well, I appreciate that. That's your opinion. I'm pretty good the way I am. The, the second is, is for us to make, make a change. And, and to say, you know what, the train wheels are coming off. I know that there's going to be skin knees ahead. But for me to realize in the, the life that is lived out in Scripture and say, that's what I want. I'm, I'm tired of just kind of going part way and limping down the road. I want to have the freedom that comes from completely knowing Christ. We know it's going to be difficult. But, oh, the rich life on the other side. The third option is to say, I know what I've got, and I know what I really want, but I'm going to push off that decision till later. In the classic Rush song, Free Will, drummer Neil Peart writes the timeless line, if we choose not to decide, we still have made a choice. See, when, when man chooses to evade the decision, he knows that there's two paths and you say, well, I, I know there's two paths, but right now I don't want to choose one or another. Evading that decision is, in its entirety, making that choice. I hope that each one of us can say, I'm going to choose a path that's clear, and I'm going to choose God's will. Let's close in prayer. Father, this, this lesson was hard for me because I grew up I, I grew up where good kids were those that had perfect attendance, that you got gold stars from memory verses. And, and Lord, thank you so much for the men and women that taught me Scripture growing up. And thank you for those that loved the Lord so much to share with me what your timeless message. But Lord, sometimes when, when I read Scripture and I, I read some of the passages about the cost of discipleship, and how difficult it was to follow after Jesus, I just pause. And Lord, I, I know that discipleship is much more costly than what we have defined. Lord, it's, it's greater. And Lord, it's, it's, it's not just a greater cost, it's a greater reward. 
Lord, we, we know that Scripture talks about truly following after you is hard, it's lonely, and it's dangerous. Lord, I pray that we size that up and we count the cost and we choose that path. Lord, I, I pray that we can pursue you with wild abandon. Lord, may your word be hidden in our hearts and your thoughts are thoughts. Lord, may we die to ourselves that you may be glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.